ate the therapy today. Yay! Yay! She's super excited. I'm like, we're everywhere. All right, so my name is Sandy, and this is Cyrus, and um, we actually have been doing beekeeping for about four years. Interestingly enough, this was the first conference I went to when I started out beekeeping. So I have been in your shoes, and so it's really weird some days to be on this side of the presentation. Um, but I started off actually with just these two hives that are here in the picture. I loved a garden, and you know, I live in Garden Oaks in Houston, so it's not a big neighborhood. I literally live on like a postage stamp lot. It's not that big. But I loved a garden. I thought, well, at least I could do something to give back to the bees. You know, at that time, everybody was, you know, really concerned. And we are still concerned about them being endangered. But I thought, well, I can put some bees in the yard, and that'll help my flowers and my vegetables. So we started there. And this guy would watch me from uh, our guest bedroom. <laughs> he didn't want anything to do with it. Who wants to mess with bees? Ah, huh? scary. <laughs> So then the next year, the guy I bought my bees from um, actually was moving out of state, and so he was selling all his gear. And so we talked, and we talked to him, and we decided, you know, what's the worst that could happen? We'll try this out, and if we, you know, if we have a lot of extra honey, guess what? Our friends and family will just love us, right? This will be fun. Well, um, it kind of took off from there. Um, we found out that a lot of people are interested in honey and bees, and so we do a little bit of everything. We do removals. We have... Um, all kinds of things that we sell like honey and honeycomb and even chocolates that have honey in them um, But primarily we sell honeycomb to restaurants in Houston So how many of you have gotten a cheese board and you had a little piece of, of like honeycomb on it or, or, uh, or Dessert there's a bunch of places in Houston that do that and uh, it's probably uh, pretty likely that if you had that it came from one of our apiaries And we have quite a few so we partner primarily with organic farms around Houston. We don't have a lot of property. As I mentioned, we live in Garden Oaks. Um, but what we realized was some of our organic farming friends, they needed pollinators. Well, we've got the pollinators, but we needed a place to put them. So they allow us to put our bees on their uh, property. The bees pollinate their farm, so they get lots more cucumbers and squash and all kinds of fun things to eat. And then we come by and we harvest the honeycomb and the honey throughout the year. So it's a great partnership between us and those organic farms. The other nice thing is it's a nice, safe place for the bees, right? Organic farm, they're not going to use pesticides. So even though bees can fly up to, you know, three to five miles, the likelihood of them uh, getting hurt at least is not there on the property that they're on. So it worked out quite well for us. So today we're going to talk about apitherapy. Apitherapy is really using all the products of the hive in order to support our health and benefits for us. And it's kind of amazing. The, the hive is it's very similar to a medicine cabinet. How many of you use Neosporin? Yeah, well, did you know you could use honey for things like that, right? It has its own antibacterial properties, a little stickier than Neosporin. But there's a lot of things in the hive that we can use for our own house. We'll go over that today. So like I mentioned when we got started, you are not allowed to sting anybody when you leave here. Cyrus and I are not medical physicians or clinicians, right? We just have knowledge that we are sharing with you, okay? And also very clearly, although these things are beneficial, we're not talking about cures. We're not going to cure anybody. That's not how this works. Think of it more like when you go to see a nutritionist or you go to see someone who is an herbalist, right? These are things that we can use from our natural environment to, to help us with our health and have benefits, but by no means are we talking cures or any kind of things like that, okay? So Which there really are clear. possibilities of helping many ailments, yes. uh, but uh, acupuncturists, herbalists, they actually can get certified and licensed. Yeah. Apitherapy has no certification or licensing in this country. Mm -hmm. um, I, we can go to all the education we want. Unfortunately, there's nothing that we can say we are certified or licensed yeah. to do anything. Um, it is also not illegal at the same time. So uh, if you come to see us, we are not going to say we will cure you. We are not going to say uh, I can alleviate these symptoms or I'm going to treat you for any ailments because then that would be practicing medicine without a license and illegal. Right. Yeah. So what we do is we'll share with you the knowledge that we have 
Um, and if you come by our house, we coach you through those things, and then we see if it works, if it helps you. Not everything works for every person, but every person is a different individual. They're so, we're so complex, it's not that way. It's not an easy, you know, take this pill or get stung once and this fixes your entire world, right? We want to be really clear about that because we're not, you know, advocating that this will um, solve all the world's ills and we have to use some common sense too. If you break your arm, a bee sting is not going to fix that for you. You need to go see your doctor. So as I mentioned, apitherapy really involves all the things that are the products of the hive. So honey, propolis, um, pollen that bees collect, um, obviously the bees themselves, and using those as potential health benefits for us. This has been going on for literally thousands upon thousands of years. So this is not a new thing. This is, you know, not cutting edge, actually. <laughs> um, it's really been around for a long time, you know, all the way back to the Egyptians, the Grecians, our Greek uh, mythology as well. And um, it's still used actually in practices in a lot of other countries as a medical practice. So there are actually clinics in Eastern European Europe and um, in Korea and many of those countries that they actually use this as part of a medical plan. So it's a very, um, very a practice that has been used for many years and continues to be used, um, just not recognized here by our medical community. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cyrus and he'll walk you through some of the softer side of these therapies. Honey, as she said, it can be used as Neosporin. Um, honey has antibacterial properties, anti-inflammatory properties, soothing for burns. Um, it also, if you have a deeper cut, it promotes tissue granulation. Somebody was telling me about their cat that the wound wasn't closing and they started putting honey on it and that helped the wound close. So tissue granulation is if you have a deeper cut, it helps those cells build in faster and fill that cut. Because obviously if you don't need stitches, if you need stitches and it's like this, you can stitch it closed. But if it's a rounded shape, you need that tissue to kind of build in. And so honey helps promote that. It can also help um, with gut, bad, bad gut bacteria, um, H. pylori, um, and things like that. So consuming honey can help also. Um, <coughs> that's yes from Tim. Um, antifungal, antibacterial, we said. Uh, uh, honey is actually one of the only things that will very minimally raise blood sugar, not like real sugar, um, cane sugar. So if you're a diabetic, you can actually consume honey and have less of a risk of it spiking your blood sugar. Obviously you wanna stay in small quantities, but it also has that beneficial enzyme um, that can help regulate blood sugar. Um, and then reducing environmental allergens. Everybody takes honey for local allergies? Mm -hmm. And here, how far away it, can you get honey that is still local to you? Within your growing region. There you go, within your growing region. Some say 50 miles, some say 100, but once what grows in that area changes, then it's different. I mean, so we're from Houston. Houston's pretty big, so if you go from um, way, way north Houston, way out in Katy, to way, way south Houston, that's 80 miles. It could be, it could work, there could be still the same things growing, but by 180 to 100 miles, things can start changing and you need to kind of watch where you're getting your honey from if it's for allergies. Now, any raw honey will do almost all of the other things. It's only the proximity that you need for the allergies. Bee pollen. Bee pollen is also helpful for allergies. You can even take non-local bee pollen for allergies, but in very small quantities because it can also make you react. Um, it teaches your body to, uh, by ingesting it, it teaches your body to recognize those pollens so that when you're out and you smell those environmental allergens and it goes in your lungs and nasal cavities, your body doesn't react as badly. And that would be taking more amounts of pollen for other reasons. Um, there's very small amounts of pollen in the raw honey and that's why you start off with that for your allergies so that you don't have a major reaction and then you can step up to taking pollen granules. Each of these little grains, that's not, each of those is not from one flower. Each of those is hundreds or thousands of flowers that were visited. And as you can see in that, and this pollen, if you wanna pass it around, it has this natural grain and encapsulation. It's actually a silica. And so you need something to break that down to consume the pollen and get all the benefits from it, which are gonna be <coughs> amino acids, protein, vitamins and minerals. It's almost a complete vitamin. And so you, you can mix it in with honey, and that's this. We call it bee bread in the apitherapy world. The stored pollen in the hive, 
You see the colorful things in all the cells, their stored pollen? That's bee bread. So we're mimicking that by adding pollen to honey and mixing. You have to let it sit for a while to break down those pollens and keep stirring it. We sell it as bee butter because it has the consistency of peanut butter. It's all tastes like flour. It literally tastes like a flower. Yeah, all it tastes very fruity and floral, like flowers. Um, it's got the flower pollen, right? So it's like, it's very, very heavily on the flowery side. We uh, sell this and market it as an energy food. It's very, it helps with allergies too, but we market it as an energy food. Can I ask you how much you sell that for? Uh, so m usually I make it in this size jar and sell it for $10. It, uh, because you're having healthy carbs from the honey. So honey is glucose and fructose. Uh, glucose burns fast, fructose burns slower. You have the beneficial enzyme in the raw honey. And then you have the pollens, which are gonna help your allergies, but also those that protein is gonna burn even slower to get you nice slow time release energy, plus uh, vitamins and minerals. And then this combination can also help um, with male prostate issues. If, you're, if men are getting up a lot throughout the night to potty, Pee, then uh, you can have a spoon of that and over time it can actually help reduce that. It's also great in the afternoon instead of a caffeinated beverage or sugary stem. Like I said, so you have nice slow time release energy. And all of the products of the hive are immune boosting. All of them. Raw honey, propolis, pollen, royal jelly, they are all going to boost your immune system. Beeswax. So make if you go around, especially busy bee, um, honey, she makes all kinds of salves and lotions. Uh, those, that's how you can use beeswax to heal some skin issues. And it can also be a carrier for other things, uh, herbs and essential oils and things like that. Uh, who likes beeswax candles? Everybody almost, right? So one thing that beeswax candles do, so soy and paraffin are the two other main candle waxes. And they actually give off toxins when they burn. Beeswax candles, when they burn, release negative ions, which bond to positively charged toxins, purifying the air. I had one client buy a candle from me. I didn't know about this. She came to me a week later and she says, I burned your candle after I cooked dinner for my boyfriend and he likes meat and I'm a vegetarian and I hate the smell of meat. And she said it took the meat grilling smell out of the apartment. I was really shocked. I didn't know it would do that. I thought that was super cool. Uh, when you eat honeycomb, so honey still in the comb with the fresh wax the wax has some minor cholesterol lowering abilities and acts as a fiber through the digestive system now you're not going to go and eat a chunk of wax to help lower your cholesterol that will have the opposite effect and block you up anybody know what propolis is what is it not not lynn <laughs> It's from sap from the trees that the, the, the bees use. It's, a, it's a tree resin that bees collect. They use it as a glue or a cement in the hive. So I assume most people in here have bees? Mm -hmm. yeah. So where your frames stick together and are touching, there's, they're always stuck together and you've got to pry them apart, right? So there and then where the frames rest on the edge of the hive, it's really sticky and they're kind of glued down. That's propolis. Um, so there's a different propolis traps and ways to collect propolis, but uh, from those frames is the safest spot to collect it from if you don't if you only have one hive and don't want to put a propolis trap in there because then you're not you definitely don't want to take it from where the lid touches the hive because they need that seal to help control the temperature and keep other pests out. Propolis is antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, retards cancer tumor growth, um, helps regulate uh, blood sugar and blood pressure. All kinds of things. Again, that's another item that you can uh, use if you make a tincture. So this was powdered propolis, and you add uh, Everclear. Some you can do rubbing alcohol if you are not going to take it orally, and then you can use that on cuts and things. And it acts as a liquid glue. It's very sticky. You have a, a cut, you can put it on there. It basically coats it as a liquid glue, almost like I'm sure you've heard of some people super gluing cuts closed. That will do that, but it's all natural. Um, what about liquid skin? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just Sticky, and then uh, you can also buy it in capsule form. You can take this as much as you want, pretty much. Every day, like vitamin C, you can take it just before cold and flu season. If you're traveling, you know, to prevent, uh, boost your immunity, prevent getting sick. Um, 
If you're on blood thinners, sometimes it's not recommended because it does have some uh, blood thinning properties. Different sources of propolis will vary in the compounds they have, and some of them will have some blood thinning properties. Yes, ma'am. So something like that, that for like the immune support. What if my daughter, she she's pregnant. Do you recommend? She can take propolis. Okay, so it's yeah. okay for that too. For pregnant, cause, yeah. Because that's something that she's been having issues with is because. <coughs> She's twi I think she's pregnant with twins, so they're Thank like you. draining her completely. Yeah. So she could yeah. take pollen too. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So support because she keeps getting like sinus, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. And um, this so is um, this actually we ended up. I mean, you can buy them um, on Amazon as well. Okay. So um, this one is Puritan's Pride, which you like. We also get YES. YS. Or YS, sorry, YS, which is an organic producer um, of propolis, which I also suggest. Um, this is hard to make, which is why we don't <laughs> so put it in capsules. <laughs> so. Um, what was it to say? So yeah, corally, propolis, um, cavities. Um, some people to heal their cavity use cloves, tea bags. Even packing that tooth with propolis because it's antibacterial can uh, get rid of that cavity and toothache sometimes promote healing in the tooth. Um, it's not a total replacement for going to a dentist, but in a pinch, um, that can work. You know, if sometimes make more propolis than others. If you find a gob of sticky stuff extra somewhere, that's probably some nice propolis you can uh, use for yourself. Some people eat it just straight out of the hive. Yeah. Like I said, you can, where's our bottle of propolis? I just Over here. Oh, you passed it around? <laughs> okay, great, so that's some collected propolis. Um, if you collect it enough over time, like I said, from the sides of the frames, you could put that in the freezer and put it in and grind it up or put it in a coffee grinder that doesn't have coffee in it, a clean one, mm -hmm. and then you'd make a powder. And after that, you could add the uh, Everclear or rubbing alcohol if you're not gonna use it orally. This, mm -hmm. since it's an Everclear, you can use it orally um, to take, if you don't like taking pills or for, for some reason like this, you can put an eyedropper of this in your coffee or tea every day, just as an immune booster. It tastes a little, it has a little bit of a like, well, so it's resin, right? So we collect resin from trees to make it, so it does kind of have a, a woodsy resin taste when you take it, just so you know. I think it is, a, <laughs> depending, they all taste a little bit different because they forage from a few different trees. I think it tastes a little bit like vanilla. You know, I don't, I don't mind it as much. Again, just like with honey, some people have different preferences for different flavors. There's another brand that we bought that the uh, propolis capsules, they smelled like bananas and I just didn't like it at all. <laughs> Can you just put the propolis, like the, the tips of it that you get in the Everclear without having to grind it up? Uh, you can, but then there's not as much surface area to draw out all the so compounds. It takes a while. Yeah, it takes a little bit longer. Yeah, you definitely want the surface area because think about it, it's basically a sticky tar. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So anything on the outside, you might draw out some of those components, but it's what's on the inside, you're not going to get the benefit of. Okay. So if, you, if that's all you wanted was that, then you could just eat that. Okay. If you don't want to do any processing or mess with it. Um, royal jelly. Um, it's made with, by the bees with honey and pollen. Mostly it, you'll find it in queen cells. We definitely do not produce royal jelly because it is a lot of work. Basically, you have to fake making queen cells, queen rearing. And then you, as soon as they do that and they Think they're making a queen you pull those larvas out and it's full of royal jelly you scoop that royal jelly out put it in t that tiny bit in a container and keep going and going and going there's some uh, bigger producers that do it you can also buy it in capsules a friend of mine is bringing some royal jelly back from mexico it's much cheaper there um but i was like no that's okay i don't need any and it's much easier to take a capsule everybody wants the magic pill uh, again immune boosting helps cell regeneration uh, it's used in a lot of beauty products, especially uh, in Korea and Asian countries. So uh, great for the skin, promotes healthy digestion. Liver cleansing helps repair the liver if you've been on a lot of medication or um, other liver issues. Anybody heard of bee air? No. Weird, right? So uh, in Slovenia and some Eastern European countries, there's these like huts, and each of these is a hive. And they, the bees can come and go from the entrance on the side of the building. Mm -hmm. And if there's a little fan with the mask here. And you just sit there and breathe in the bee air for about 15 minutes or so. Now, you don't want to do it too often because having that fan suck all that air out of the hive uh, can, you know, you're hurting those bees by doing too much to them. 
so you don't want to do it too often, but obviously they would take breaks or alternate hives. You know, if you just had one hive in the backyard, you could, if you're handy, you could probably make one of these, or they sell one online for about $300. Bee Air is great for, again, immune boosting, but it's all the products of the hive. The honey, the propolis, the royal jelly, a little bit of wax, the bee enzyme, pollen, all of that is aerosol inside the hive, and so you're breathing that into your lungs. And it's been known to possibly heal everything from asthma, COPD, um, lung cancer even, all kinds of things. So that's, you know, something you don't hear about every day. And uh, we have not bought this unit yet just because it's $300 and we have another request for it. But uh, eventually we'll get one. Did we'll you have a question? We'll let you know how it goes. Somebody had a question over here? Well, you answered my question. Okay. The big one, bee venom therapy. That's why everybody's here, right? Yeah. So purposeful stinging with honeybees. Um, you know, it's not just going out and sticking your hand in the hive and getting stung, and that's not what anybody's doing here. I don't recommend that to anybody. I, like we said, we don't recommend anybody leave this class and say, oh, I have some ailment. I'm gonna go sting myself immediately. It's, you kinda wanna be careful with it. You are still getting stung by bees. It's still not a 100% safe practice. Done the right way, anything can be, you can take some of those risks away. So um, we use live bees. Most people use live bees. If you don't have bees, some people that treat themselves order bees from a couple of different people that will ship them in a little box. Um, anybody hear Bach queens before? So you know they come in a little in a little cage like this. So a bigger one of these, filled with about 60 bees, is what some people that order um, if they're treating an illness. So uh, we'll get to those illnesses in a second. So you can also, there's two labs that you could order injectable venom from, but then who wants to deal with needles? That's even scarier for me. I don't like that. And uh, then if you do too much or too little or it's exposed to oxygen, then maybe you ruin that whole vial that you just spent a bunch of money on. Um, but that's why we use live bees. It's much easier for most of us. Um, you can treat uh, most immune disorders, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, um, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, almost any musculoskeletal issue, arthritis, tendinitis, um, nerve, nerve issues, helps reactivate nerves. Lyme disease is one of the biggest ones. Um, it's a three year protocol and you work up to 10 stings three times a week and you skip days and it takes up to three years. Some people a little less, some people a little bit more. Um, and then again, like we said, everybody's a little bit different so maybe um, you might need to work up to 15 or 20 stings. It depends how you react and how you respond to what's happening in your body. Again, this has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. We're not telling you anything new here. It's been going on for thousands of years. Um, so, what's this? Oh, our case study, our customer, <laughs> our client. So we have an 85 year old woman. She started with us last November, I think. And uh, she had severe arthritis in her knees. She was using a cane. She was basically, they have a big house. She was basically relegated to her bedroom because she could hardly walk. Um, so much pain, she couldn't stand in the kitchen to cook. She couldn't go shopping. Um, you know, just a, not a fun life. So she decided she would give us a try. She came over. And you know, we kind of talked to her. We learned. We always ask people about their health history, see if they're on any medication that might um, make it more dangerous. We do some tests. So one of the tests we do to see if somebody might be allergic is we give them one grain of the pollen, just one, one of these little things. Let it dissolve in their mouth. After 20 minutes, if they have no itching, redness, swelling, hives, anything like that, we <coughs> give them two of these little grains of pollen. And then if they have no reaction after that, it is more likely that they will not have an allergic reaction. And when I say allergic reaction, I'm talking about anaphylaxis, where your throat closes up, your lips turn blue, your tongue swells, and you might die. And in that case, you need an EpiPen, part of our safety. Always have an EpiPen. All beekeepers should have one just in case, even if you're not allergic. Sometimes it's hard for your doctor to give you one because he says, oh, you're not allergic to bee stings. You don't need one. So why should I give you one? They want to give you something for an ailment you already have. So it's pretty tough to get them sometimes. You can, you know, maybe Just go keep asking. Ask <laughs> other physicians. <laughs> yeah. 
And then yeah. all Facebook we point ninety and they will there you give go. it to you. There you go. It's always better to have one than not. And Benadryl. Two Benadryl will stop most reactions. Mm -hmm. Now even anaphylaxis. Not anaphylaxis yeah. unless we can't clear. If, so so um, <laughs> Well, after this, I was going to tell you that, but I'll, I'll jump into this other story. Uh, one of our mentors uh, has, has been doing this for a significantly long time. She basically solely does apotherapy and acupuncture, and uh, she sung herself. She gets sung all the time. She has bees. She practices this as like her main business, and she was experiencing anaphylaxis. Somebody that gets sung regularly, which is very weird. Typically, it's long periods of time that you don't get stung is when you might have that experience because your physiology, the physiology of your body might change over that time period. Um, other things that might factor that in is not having a good enough lunch or enough food before getting stung, which was one of her, her factors that she had. She didn't have a good enough meal that day. The other factor was she was on her cycle. And your body changes a lot during that time period. Uh, menstruation and menopause, um, even men getting older, less lower testosterone levels, all these things, any physiological change, medication, um, just time, diet, all those things can factor into your reaction and how good or bad it is. So that's anaphylaxis reaction. But what is an allergic reaction? Anything, a bump, a little bit of redness, that's still called an allergic reaction. The main thing we're concerned with is almost dying, your throat closing up, tongue swelling, lips turning blue. Um, let's say you get stung on your wrist. If you have hives somewhere else on your body, that's an indication of a severe reaction that could come down the line as well. Um, so what about bench neck like using it and said if you can't get an egg neck, you can't even afford that? So, so that is great for a minor reaction, but not for anaphylaxis. Well, people who have been bitten by venomous snakes can pull off the venom. So what if you like slap it right where you've been? I mean, I know it can't like undo everything, but it can. Possibly, you know? um, different types of venom react differently. Yeah. So um, that I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, it's not as, like your foolproof. Like, I would just I would recommend like, that. Um, some people else. use baking soda um, salves also, but yeah. betonite clay does work for localized right. issues. Yeah. And, and if you and if you don't have you know if you don't have an epipen, then nine one one, which you're gonna have to call nine one one anyways. Anytime you use an epipen, you have to call nine one. Or, or have, or if you're, you're, you don't have time and you're with a partner, they need to take you to the emergency room immediately <coughs> after you use your EpiPen. Even if you misuse the EpiPen. Right. I had a guy with me learning how to do bee removal and he thought he was having anaphylaxis and he was talking to me just like this, normal. He wasn't huffing and puffing, he wasn't turning blue or red or anything weird. And I was like, what? And uh, he, he, so he came and told me that he just, I'm having an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, I'm gonna go hit, use my EpiPen. And I was like, and before I knew it, he had stabbed himself in the leg and used his EpiPen. And this was very unnecessary. So does anybody know what is in the EpiPen? Epinephrine. Epinephrine. Yeah. It's adrenaline. Your heart, if you don't need it, your heart is gonna start racing. And it, it, in certain cases, in some people, you could even have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So you go immediately to the emergency room after that. So that was yeah, a nice- He had a panic attack, is what he had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice uh, emergency room bill for him. <laughs> Anyway, so our client, uh, she came to us with her severe knee arthritis. And with anything, uh, if they do well after that pollen, we only start with one sting that day as a test to see how it's going, um, to see the reaction. Um, and if they have a bad reaction, then we either slow down. Of course, we have Benadryl and EpiPen around just in case. Uh, and then she did well. She responded fine. Just a little bit of redness, a little bit of swelling. That's fine. That's normal. We're happy to see that. So after that, she continued. After the third session, I, at that point, we had still only gotten up to two stings. Her son-in-law threw away her cane. Just clarification, redness, swelling at the side? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So out. like yes. I said, if you right. get stung at any, you're out and you're outside, never mind apotherapy, if you get stung, you get hives or something in another part of your body, right. that's a concern. Yeah. That's a yeah. Localized anything, even if it's severe swelling locally, that is not a concern for your life. So your hands, you get sun in your hand, your hand balloons up. Let's say you, you don't care about healing anything. You can take a couple of Benadryl, that'll heal it yeah. just fine. Or the bentonite clay will work for that also. 
Um, anyway, so after the third time she came, her son-in-law threw away her cane. We, we were very shocked ourselves. We didn't think it would work that well or that fast. And uh, she, the, her other issue was her finger. She could not bend her finger. And, and, and she loved to knit, and so she couldn't knit very well. Like She was working around <coughs> her finger, and in fact, she, we didn't sting her finger at first because she was worried that it would swell up and she wouldn't be able to finish um, a, a, a piece she was working on for one of her family members. But then... But then she came. We did one sting on her finger. The next, I don't know if she came two days later or the week after. She could do this. Then we did one more sting that time, and she could do this. We, honestly, we were shocked. We could, couldn't believe it. So, again, everybody is different. Everybody will respond differently. Everybody will react differently as far as swelling and redness and everything. Um, some people might take... Um, weeks or months or we'll have to work up to more stings depending on what's wrong with them or, or how they react to <coughs> notice any positive result. Yeah. And so the big story for her is, like you heard earlier, she literally was kind of confined to this bedroom. She couldn't get around, she couldn't see her family, she couldn't cook for her family, and that was a really big deal. She loved to cook. And then by the time that um, we got, got her through just the beginning of the process, she was able to walk up and down the stairs so she could get throughout her house. Um, she now goes to the Galleria and walks around and goes shopping. Then most importantly, she's back in the kitchen and she can cook for her family and stand at the stove where she never was able to do that before. So the quality of life that now she has is night and day. And that's been probably the biggest indicator. And is she completely pain free? No, I mean, she's 85, right? She still has mornings where it hurts when she gets out of the bed and it's too long, but by and large, she is functional again um, versus um, essentially not having the quality of life she wanted. Was yes, she sir. In her 80s? Uh huh. In her, yeah. 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 Was she, what type of arthritis was she? Regular arthritis. Regular arthritis. Not rheumatoid. Rheumatoid is a whole nother ball game. Well, that's what I want to learn about. <laughs> <laughs> you have my number. <laughs> <laughs> because she, what, when they have one like a, a, a a joint or whatever, you try and get the shot as close or the sting as possible. No, as you can. just off the joint. So think about it. Even if, let's say, you're going for a cortisone shot or anything, and they go in, right into that joint, yeah. all that stuff is going in there. Where's the space in that joint for any of that stuff to go? If you have any swelling inside that joint, it doesn't have any place to go. So yeah. you're going to sting just off of off the joint. But I, I mean, if you have a knee, you don't give it in their in their leg or something like that. You give it as close just, to, just off, close to the just effective, off and around. As close to the effect. Bee venom will travel. Your body learns about the venom and it travels through the pathways. So what I was just gonna get to was uh, MS, Lyme disease, uh, and uh, immune disorders, which yeah. rheumatoid arthritis is one. Um, you sting up and down the spine, not on the spine, the sides of the spine. And uh, you know, again, we always start out with one sting and then you work up based on tolerance and need of the person. <coughs> and so that way it finds all the pathways in the body and travels through the body to where it needs to go, killing any bacteria, kickstarting the body's natural healing process, and boosting the immune system. One of the main things that bee venom also does is cell membrane penetration in the capillaries. So what does, do your capillaries and blood vessels do? They transport blood, but what does blood do? It transports oxygen. That's the main thing. Aside from calories, we need oxygen. No oxygen, we die. How do we heal? We heal with oxygen. People go into hyperbaric chambers, they do all kinds of oxygen therapies to heal. So that cell membrane penetration that the bee venom allows those cells to open up and membrane penetration, that allows more oxygen to areas and healing. Um, like I said, so with rheumatoid arthritis and other immune disorders, you would go up and down, autoimmune disorders, you would go up and down the spine, but also then you could go to other problem areas. So if you have, um, with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Lyme disease, MS, if you have an issue in another part of your body, then you can go to that other body part as well. So um, for me, I had a shoulder issue, and I, it was not a big enough tear for surgery, and a cortisone shot didn't do anything, and uh, hydrocodone didn't help with any pain. So this was before I was a beekeeper. I went to acupuncture for six months, and that healed it. So now, fast forward, I'm a beekeeper. Now if I have a shoulder issue, I sting myself in the shoulder. But when we first learned about this, when we went to our very first class, uh, it was a longer program than 45 minutes, 
I got one sting in my shoulder, didn't do anything, <coughs> felt like a regular sting. But then she stung me again in another spot and it hurt worse than any other sting I have ever had. When you find the right spot that needs it, you will feel it. It will hurt a lot more. You might get some sweats. You kind of, you definitely need food beforehand, not like immediately, but you have to have a good meal that day. You could easily pass out. Um, and then of course, hydration is very important as well. Yes. And so have you ever um, experimented with you've been to um, acupuncture and I have as well do you actually try it on the acupuncture points? definitely so that's that's one of the guides that uh, a lot of apotherapists <coughs> use is the acupuncture points um, some others use energy channels and then right. you know some people you kind of got to be in tune with the person you're working with and kind of listen right. to them and, and see like, yeah and, and feel like, them and that you know Sounds kind of quirky, but their energy and what's going on with them. And sometimes, you know, you can tell where they need it. Right. And that's why you were explaining when you're in the right area, it hurts because it's the same thing. Like you're, the idea in Eastern medicine is that you have this heat built up in your body. Definitely. That's what's creating the illness. Yeah. So then it hurts because all this heat. Yeah. Absolutely. So these are some of the actual elements that are within the bee venom that actually support um, this idea around um, it, it helping your body, right? So these elements actually encourage the body to send blood and oxygen to the area, but also the components help the body to heal at the same time. It does hurt, we're not gonna say it doesn't hurt when you have a bee sting, but at the same time your body's reaction to it and incorporating these elements within the bee venom help it to heal. And that's where you start to see the benefits of it. Now we've had also, I'm sorry, go ahead. The melaton, the main component, that's the one that other things, other stinging insects don't have as much of. And that's the thing we're most concerned with that will kill types of cancer, kill bacteria, kill viruses. There was just a study of it killing the AIDS virus. And this is why people with Lyme disease go to bees because it kills bacteria, but it takes a long time because you can't kill all that bacteria in the body at once. Because when those bacteria die, it's a toxin in your body and your body has to clean it out. Yes. I want to add on to what you were, what you were saying. Um, two weeks ago, I got stung accidentally walking. I'd never been, I've been playing with bees my whole life, never got stung by one. Got stung, and it was in the end of my toe. And whoa, daddy, I thought I was gonna die. So certain soft that tissue daddy areas. That I got up, my knee was really humming, and my neck had this thing that was really hurting. I was walking to Walmart when this happened, and I wanted to make sure, what did I just get stung by? And I found little guys dying, you know, it was stuck in there. I know it was stuck in there because I could feel yeah. it. Yeah. it was stuck in there. Within about 20 minutes, I wasn't even thinking about this, but 20 minutes later, I had a strange, overwhelming kind of sense of well-being, like a, a lot of peaceful, calm, warm. And there was no pain in my knee, and there's stuff in my neck. It was, Wow, that's amazing. I don't know if I could do that every day. You don't have to do so, so none of these uh, suggestions ever do it every day because it is still a venom or toxin in the body and you need a day to recover from that. So you skip days. So, like I said, the Lyme disease, they do three days a week, yeah. either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or some variation. So is it likely that I'll get a medium? Like one of the acupuncture that, or maybe you have some other underlying issue that the venom was responding to to help your body. And so do you leave the stinger in there? Mm -hmm. We leave the stinger in. So that's just like beekeeping. Everybody argues of screen bottom, solid bottom, this type of box, that type of box, you know, queen excluder, no queen excluder. So we do four minutes. And at that point you get about 90% of the venom. Some people say, oh no, you have to do 15 minutes. So you get 98% of the venom. And some people do 20 minutes. So you get 99% of the venom. Uh, at four minutes, you're getting 90% of the venom and somebody doesn't have to sit there for 20 minutes with the stinger in them, which after time, it doesn't hurt as much. Only that initial poke of it breaking the skin is the painful part. So you might feel some burning of, of the pumping of the venom going in, but bee venom is its own analgesic. So Tylenol, Advil, those are all analgesics, anti-pain. It's also an anti-inflammatory. That's why it's great for arthritis and things like that. Can you just squeeze the, the uh, stinger to help release the No, because you're more than likely to pop it than to squeeze it oh, through. Okay. It, yeah. it pumps on its own. I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah, yeah it, it, that little white white sack on the end of the stinger, it'll go, it pumps like a little heart if you watch it really close. It's pretty cool. Yes, sir. Oh. No? How many of you have gotten stung as beekeepers? I mean, you guys probably do, right? 
Do you feel any different? Do you have any, I mean, does, what do you guys think? You guys get stuck. I had a warming sensation in the hand or whatever the day after. Okay. Yeah. A lot of beekeepers no longer have arthritis in the hands because that's one of the most common places we get stung. And then... Let me ask you this. How about gout? So, uh, I have gout. He's a gout man. It, it, it can help temporarily with the pain and inflammation. And I've, I've tried it. But, the, I mean, I could talk to you for hours about gout. But... Avoiding rich and fatty foods and high protein foods and beer are going to be your main thing. We did all that. It didn't help. Oh, yeah? I mean, I'm, I hadn't even thought about stinging myself with the yeah. it, it can help a little bit because of promoting blood flow and, and cleaning everything up. But uh, kidney health is one thing. You can talk to me after. I got a bunch of suggestions for that. <laughs> So this is essentially just what the nerve looks like and some of the interactions between the venom and the nerve itself. Um, one of the things that's, that's really interesting about bee stinging therapy and nerve damage is essentially you're trying to reactivate that nerve, right? That's what ends up happening. It's blood flow comes to the area where the nerve is, the nerve ending that's not working, and through that process it starts to heal. Um, I'll say even for myself, a couple of, uh, about a year ago, actually, so this is my public service announcement for um, anybody, anybody who sits at an office desk with their legs crossed all day long. So if you ever have your leg fall asleep, yeah, me too. And then one day, it didn't wake up at all. Um, so I had uh, compressed the nerve that was behind my knee, and I stood up, and I had, uh, I had pumps on, like heels, right? Yeah, the, the foot wouldn't work. I couldn't lift it all of a sudden. I, mean, I couldn't feel down the front of my leg. And so, you know, I was like, oh my gosh. I called him. I was like, can you bring me some flats? Because I, I literally cannot walk in my heels. It's not going to work. And so saw a neurologist, and, or actually saw the foot doctor first, and he sent me to the neurologist. But literally, it was the nerve. It, I had squeezed it and squeezed it so much that it had not, it was completely compressed and wouldn't um, communicate down my foot. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, it is. So the, the fun news of that is the neurologist, um, after you know, kind of watching me walk for literally like this far, he was like, "Oh yeah, I know what you got." And so essentially, I had to wear high tops for about uh, well, it turned out to be three months, but he wow. said it could be up to six months. And so the high tops would actually hold my ankle, so I wouldn't have to wear a brace. So it made sense. But what we ended up doing is essentially using the bee venom therapy. So I was a little skittish. I was like, I'm not sure about this. And you know how, how, how much it'll hurt like to put a bee sting in the back of your knee. It was painful, I will tell you. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh. But every time I did it, it improved by nearly 50%. So where he said I was gonna be in high tops for like six months, it was literally three. It was half that time. So now I still wear my high tops sometimes just to be cool. But, yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. I do not. I try not to. Yeah, don't. If, if they fall asleep, don't do it. I'm telling you, it was not fun. So uh, back with the nerves again, uh, it can help with neuropathy as well, which a lot of people have. But a lot of uh, when I meet people, I go over their diet and other health regimens also because. A lot of these underlying issues, these are symptoms of something else, diabetes or, or malnutrition or things like that. So if we can clean up their diet and, and uh, their lifestyle, sometimes that can help alleviate a lot of symptoms as well. Well, I think you went over this, but. I did. And, and one thing to also remember, um, we also go over a lot of their medication history too with us because a lot of the medicines um, will not interact well with the bee venom therapy, um, especially if it's like a steroid, right? If you're taking all these um, medicines to decrease inflammation, well, the bee, venom the bee venom is actually the opposite of that, right? You're trying to get your body to react to the venom and bring oxygen and blood to those areas. So we've seen individuals who are on lots of those medicines for good reason, so I'm not saying it's not but you won't see the kind of um, benefits because it's basically working against each other. And the other big one is beta blockers. Yeah. For uh, anybody on beta blockers for their heart. What about chemo? Chemo? Um, I'm not sure about the bee venom, but I know a lot of people take propolis along with chemotherapy and it makes it more effective, actually. I think MD Anderson is actually studying Doing it right now. Doing a study now. on that right now. Yeah. I'm wondering about 
So the versus, oh, instead of, so there have been some studies of it killing non-metastatic cancers. Melanoma, isolated tumors, it can reduce the tumor size for sure. It's the only one chemo for rheumatoid. Really? My rheumatoid, my mother died of it, and they don't make a chart tall enough to register my rheumatoid. That doesn't sound like fun. But the chemo does alleviate the problem, but I got 17 lines. Yeah. I got availability for my alternative right. to get off the chemo. Yeah, you only need one hive, really, for any of this. You know, the, people sometimes tell us, oh, but the bee dies when she stings. Yes, she does, it's very unfortunate. But the queen lays 2,000 eggs a day. And one of the things we do is we take the foragers from the outside of the hive that are in the last about week of their life so that we're not taking any resources from the hive, which of course, you're not taking that many bees away. It shouldn't hurt your hive. If, if you're only doing it for yourself, you shouldn't be taking away enough bees to hurt your hive. So you just I'm wondering about those. To start trying to alleviate the rheumatoid. You know, I need, I mean, I use it for my wrist now. Yeah. yeah. Well, since, since you much. know, at your stage and the amount of beekeeping and the amount of, that you get stung, you could probably start higher. But everybody's different. A higher number of stings. Like, you know, uh, I would, you call me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> call, call me. Well, yeah, yeah. Just move, move slowly, and be, and make sure you always have somebody with you in case anything happens. I just don't like the thought of one milliliter of Yeah. No, I actually just had somebody with rheumatoid arthritis uh, call me and uh, want to come, and she sent me her list of medications this long, and I was like, oh boy. What do I do here? <laughs> and uh, so, I, you know, I, I gave her a huge list of things to do before we start this to kind of clean everything up and try to get off some of the steroids. Steroids and a lot of medications that they use for these things, methotrexate and things like that, are very damaging to your liver and kidneys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, can you, if you're on a lot of medications and you take, you have to taper off, you know, you need to talk to your doctor and taper off very safely because that can, you can have a bad withdrawal from that too and reaction. Um, but you know, do you wanna get into a little bit more level of pain and then use a more natural thing so you're not just killing your organs along the way? But again, all within the consultation of your physician and we are not medical providers. Okay? I don't see MD on you either. <laughs> no MDs, no MDs. Kids, but not with anything. <laughs> there you go. So I'm curious, how do you administer the bee? How do you have so, the live bee? So uh, some people, like I said, they will order their bees on, mm -hmm. um, and then they keep them in something called a Beza hut, which is just a little tiny box. Um, and that's like the Lyme disease and MS people that do it to themselves. If you have a hive, a thousand ways to do it, but I like to go out to my hive with this little jar. I put this over the entrance. I wait until however many bees I want fly in. I put this on, got a little just window screen with a hole in it, use the tweezers, Grab one, sting. Grab one, sting. Some now, people. Now that sounds easy. They do run around, so you do. Have yeah, to I'm, chasing, I'm chasing them around there is with this a jar. Learning but. curve to actually crabbing a bee in bees, but you will yeah. learn. <laughs> so I prefer regular tweezers, but most people with um, autoimmune disorders, Lyme disease, MS, they like the reverse tweezers. So reverse means you squeeze and they open instead of squeeze and they close. That way you can prep however many bees you're doing with multiple sets of bees and have them ready to go and just go pop, 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 pop with all the bees. And of course the, the bee is going to drop her stinger because she's not comfortable, she's being held, she wants to let be let go. And so in that scenario, most of the time, you know, you just graze where you would, where you expect her to, or want her to drop her stinger and they will. So it's very rare that we get one that isn't just fine doing that. So, and if, she, and if she doesn't, she gets to go back with the hive. We'll just release her. So. And then also, so since, a bee can live anywhere from 15 minutes to three days without her stinger. The thing that it does is it opens up her gut or intestines basically. And sometimes, I don't know if you see yourself get stung, there's a big yellow or orange thing that comes out with it. That's basically her intestines because that bright yellow color, that's bee poop. It's all over my car. <laughs> so uh, it's recommended to either crush the bee or drown them in soapy water afterwards to be a more humane, faster kill. So it's quicker. They yeah. And you can slide the hole out and sit there with the Yes. Yep. There's there's 
a thousand a ways to do it. Contraptions. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Yeah, that one's good too. Everybody has their preference. So. So, the, the, like I said, I some, I've, that. I've heard of some people uh, sticking their hand in the hive, and you know that's not recommended. This is a very controlled, controlled way to do it, so you, you know more. Of a, you can measure. Okay, I did three bees for X amount of minutes. This time, next week, I'm going to do four. Okay, four. I kind of react. My I swell too much. I'm going to stick at four, and then you know, kind of maybe stay at four for a couple of weeks, and then you know, once you're you don't react as much, then you can move on. Because in the in the beginning, so. This lady, this 85-year-old woman, she's been coming to us since October, almost every week, um, sometimes twice a week. And so at this point in time, she just gets a little bump and a little bit of redness. But in the beginning, her whole leg swelled significantly and got very red. So, I mean, again, it's just like anybody with anything, we're all gonna react different. You gotta be mindful of everything. And, and in her situation, so now she does not come as frequently, she doesn't need as much, so she's gotten to kind of a stable um, level, but I mean, but she does continue to come and you know, she'll be gone, she tra now she travels um, and does all these things, and so she'll be gone for a month or two and then she'll come back and we'll see her for a couple weeks. And, At 85, yeah. you know, just some things just don't last that long. Yeah. So we're not gonna cure no. her pain forever, it's just gonna <coughs> alleviate the symptoms and give her a better quality of life. Have you ever heard of um, a person who is not allergic to bees, say, become allergic to bees? Mm -hmm. And is it a vitamin deficiency? It, uh, like I said, anybody can be, uh, I told you the story about our, our mentor that she gets stung all the time. She had a minor, oh, I didn't finish that, did I? <laughs> oh, okay. So she had a, she had a, she stung herself, she had a min minor anaphylactic reaction. Not very fast, where it closed up very fast. But she's a professional, she knew what was happening. She took some Benadryl, she took a homeopathic remedy called Apis, and so and she happened to be going to dinner with some doctors that night. So she, since she understood all the symptoms and what was happening to her, she let the, these, she happened to be going to dinner with doctors, so she let them know what was happening, and she just sat there through dinner and you know kind of worked through it. Um, any, anybody else that wasn't going to dinner with doctors and didn't know this emergency room for sure, Anybody can become anaphylactic allergic at any time, like I said, based on medication, diet, physiological changes, um, long periods in between being stung. So you can. But, there's, but is there anything that you know of that will help reverse that reaction? Uh, there, you can go to immunotherapies with allergists. Um, sometimes that can work, sometimes it can't. Sometimes, like this woman, she was fine after that. It was mostly because she was on her period and she didn't have a good lunch. So. Everybody's different. You just gotta be safe and figure it out. Can you take the Apis instead of Benadryl? Yeah, you can. And it's like a 30C or what? A couple of the pellets. Okay. I, I don't think you can overdose on that, so. Mm -hmm. Just like most of the homeopathic yeah, remedies, they're pretty Parkinson's, safe. Or should I call y'all about that? Like, part, my dad has Parkinson's. Parkinson's? Yeah. So that's not a very specific where you, where you would stay on that. So most, um, Immune disorders, autoimmune disorders, mm -hmm. you go up and down the spine. Mm -hmm. But so again, you okay. start very slow. And then if you're having tremors or nerve damage in one area or something, mm -hmm. then you could do that area. But you want to hit the path. Basically, all your nerves and pathways are up and down your spine, right? That's what your That's spinal cord right. is. tells your body what to do and everything. Yeah. So you want to hit all those highways. And your body will tell that your, the venom and your body work together, and it finds where it needs to go. Are you all in Houston? Yeah. yeah. Because I, I don't know why, I don't know. I would want to play with it, Yeah, the, the people that have, not everybody can have a hive, but we definitely recommend people that can, that have long-term disorders like Lyme or MS, become a beekeeper. So that if, I mean, we're happy to help them as long as they need, but then at a certain point, you might be able to do it yourself. Yeah. So like Nellis could probably do it herself. She's, you know, fully capable, but they don't have a hive and I, I think she just likes coming now. Yeah. <laughs> we enjoy it. Now she's like family. You know, where I was like, hey, here, have some honey. And she brings lunch. And <laughs> so. Are you speaking yeah. specifically on meridians or just up and down the spine? Um, so uh, most people, targeting specifically? most of the people doing this for the Lyme disease is kind of the biggest one. Most of them are doing it themselves. And they're using long tweezers and hitting their back. So they might not be hitting it perfectly. But like I said, the venom knows where to go. It travels through the body. All right, we have about five more minutes. Yeah. 
Yeah, any, any tendonitis, uh, arthritis, any of those kind of issues. Also, Sorry? Also yeah. yeah. Any inflammation? It can, but there's other, if it's just certain cramps sometimes, then uh, there's other maybe vitamin deficiencies you might have in stretching. Okay. But th then if you've already done all that and your diet's good, then possibly. Honey every day for like a preventative. Yeah. How much? A, a tablespoon. Okay. Yeah. It's good for your allergies too. A, as much or as little as you want. Um, yeah. Raw honey, if you put it in hot tea or hot coffee over 140 degrees, it pasteurizes it. It's no longer raw. So if you're having tea or coffee and that's how you want to take your honey, make it, put your milk in it or whatever you're doing, or let it cool just a little bit and then add it because you don't want to cook the honey. It's still healthier than sugar at that point, mm -hmm. but it, you kill that beneficial enzyme in the honey. Yes? And is that, that same enzyme in your stuff, is that what I was going to ask you about? That enzyme that you're saying lowers the bad cholesterol. What uh, is no, the name of that enzyme? Or it reduces something. You're talking about it reduces something. So, so the, the enzyme is super healthy. It's, so right. bees go to a flower, they get nectar. Right. They come back to the hive. After that, they pass it to each other. And that's where the enzyme comes from, from inside the bee. Right. right. So that, but that beneficial enzyme is what is so immune boosting to us. Right. And I was asking, what is the name of that enzyme? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it's multiple enzymes. I mean, it's just oh, like okay. us having different flora and fauna in our gut. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I saw it with one specific. So um. So there is something called chitin, which is ground up bees. Uh, so, so mm -hmm. you, <laughs> yes. It's, it's protein. There is other health benefits of it. That is a whole section of aphid therapy that we don't usually cover. That's super advanced because most ninety-eight percent of people either don't want to do that or don't have the capability to do that. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so you can dry them and yeah. you know pulverize, you know make them into a powder, grind them up. I, we've heard of people put it in tea, put it in just something to drink. All There's another thing called apel arnel, which is ground up drone brew. You can have it as a milk, or they can dry it. It's a powder, and uh, that's great for uh, prostate issues, uh, low hormone levels, all kinds of things. That are They're also using honey now for skin cancer. Yeah. So one of the other things about bee venom is it can also soften scar tissue. Yeah. I'll tell you the security because I want to do this presentation, but I've been curious. What about bee bread? Yeah, so uh, we passed the bottle around. Yeah. Bee bread is super good for you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You, you, you don't need to scrape anything. Honey is antibacterial. It, it, it's fine. You, I mean, if you have dirt or something in there. Yeah, but other than that, like uh, daily, just cleansing or whatever. Yes, just yeah. so daily. Honey, honey on wounds, you don't have to clean and reapply every day because it is antibacterial. You can apply some and then wrap it just so you're not touching everything that's sticky everywhere. And then maybe every three to five days, you can uh, clean it with some warm water and then reapply. Because that was my problem. It's like how um, I took the bandage off. It would just come back and it's like you're standing away from the bandage. Yeah. So what do you do to that? So some people will, well, you can use either different kinds of bandages and things so that it's more of a barrier. Some people will use saran wrap. Um, yeah, so it doesn't actually end up getting caught in, I see what you're saying, in the bandage. Yeah, right? not too sticky. Also, yeah. you can mix it with aquaphor or medical yeah. lubricants, um, castor oil jelly if you want a more natural thing to thicken it so it doesn't ooze everywhere. Because your body is warm, so it will make the honey run. So if you mix it with one of those things, it can be a little bit thicker for application.